<clears throat> I, had, I had to get rid of this thing because I grew up Baptist, and, and you just do not want me that close to a pulpit. <laughs> when I was in the eighth grade, I liked a girl. And like any self-respecting romantic, I did what? Flowers, Flowers come on. I made her a tape. Now, it, it was not a mixtape, however. I needed one song and one song only. So I got her tape deck and I mashed down, play and record at the same time. And I queued up the end credits of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. You know, and to be honest, I don't know if it was Brian Adams that actually put the final nail in that coffin, but she moved on to somebody, you know, taller. And honestly, it was no big deal because I was pretty good with the ladies. Of course, it wasn't until years later that I discovered making eye contact from across food court isn't exactly good with the ladies. But by then it didn't really matter because I discovered things like logic and reason and rational thought. For me, you know, kind of within this weird religious framework, but it left very little room in my life for things like romance and emotion. And the traces that existed were pl pretty much obliterated by the hard knocks of my 20s. And I really want to just walk like all the way over there, but I'm not going to. Uh, the thing about hard knocks is when they turn to near death, they can teach you some things if you let them. And I learned that logic isn't always logical. And I learned that sometimes the irrational is right. And the unreasonable is sometimes advisable. And I learned that the best decisions rarely make sense on paper. I had to make a difficult decision recently. After several years freelancing, I decided it was time for me to go back to work. And I never actually made the decision be to become a freelancer in the first place. I got laid off in 2008, like just about everybody else. And then again, six months later. So it was kind of by default, I found myself in my sweatpants at home, scraping and clawing for every single dollar and trying to figure out exactly what it is that I do. And it was pretty fantastic. But I never, I never had to take that leap of faith that I know is on, on the forefront of many of your minds after a weekend like this. But rather, I was just kind of thrust into it. And that's how a lot of things have been for me. Back in 2000, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. And so, while well, all my peers were experiencing these big life changes, starting families and careers and moving all around the world to these amazing places. I was experiencing some life change too, but I had absolutely nothing to do with it. And over time, that's kind of just like, that became like a pattern in my life where I just expected the unfortunate to happen. You know, it, it, like Charlie Brown or something. And like, I, I was never surprised if like the ice cream just plopped off of my cone or I, I got locked out of the house or ran out of gas or got a flat tire. In fact, one time, we were, we were driving from Michigan down to Cincinnati, and the car was running really weird, you know? I was, I was driving along, and it would just kind of be like, and, you know, so I'd pull over, pop up the hood, and look under there, and I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> and so I'd kick the tires, uh, seems fine to me, so I just kept on going. And it'd be fine for a little while, and then it'd get a little bit shaky, until we got about halfway through Ohio right near uh, Bowling Green. They're cheering for Bowling Green. And I'm driving down I-75, you know, and all of a sudden, it's just like And then, so I'm trying to like veer off into the fast lane shoulder, I-75, and I got about halfway off, and then just And I watched as my tire, my whole wheel just went rolling away into the median. And that kind of stuff, you know, we can laugh about it, but it was like, seriously, all the time. I just expected, like a dark cloud was over my head at all times. And it got to the point where, you know, I just grew very tired of it, you know? And, and a lot of you know I have, I have a, a faith framework for my life that gives me at least some sort of ability to 
some perspective on difficulty. And I had dealt with my mortality and death and all of that stuff already, but the idea of growing old absolutely terrified me. Because the thought of six more decades, like the past one that I'd had, just sounded so exhausting. And I didn't want to do it. But I got into therapy, which most of you probably should do. <laughs> and by my next birthday, my perspective had changed. Life is not something to be endured. It's an adventure. It's going to be tough, absolutely. But no great story ever comes without difficulty. Imagine, imagine this one, for example. Hobbit finds ring takes Ring home, and lives the rest of his days. <laughs> or, eccentric scientist bumps his head on the toilet, has a vision of the flux capacitor, which is what makes time travel possible. <laughs> Sells big idea to government, makes plenty of dough, and dies gently of old age, leaving his family a vast inheritance. So his grandchildren shall never have to wear thrift shop clothes. And there's you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with those stories. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with selling big ideas. But it's not much of an adventure. And so <clears throat> I decided if trouble's going to find me, I'd like to have a little bit of a say as to what kind of shenanigans I get myself into. So I committed to get into more trouble, good trouble the kind of stuff that's risky and dangerous because it is worthwhile. Because I want to smell, see air, and feel the undertow, and touch the tops of the trees, and dragon scales. And I want to taste sweet and salty and spicy. Oh, man. The, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I want to see miracles like human beings producing other human beings. And really, that's, that's one of the most dangerous things of all, isn't it? I mean, for all the women in here, it, 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 historically, it's been one of the most dangerous things you can do is, is give birth to a child. And, and all of you, or most of you at least, at some point or another, have to make that decision if that's a risk you're willing to take. Because honestly, it, even if you survive the childbirth, you, your child might not or it might have a problem, it might have a birth defect or a disability, or your partner might leave you alone to raise this kid, or she might eventually become a teenager and hate you for absolutely no reason whatsoever. <laughs> and you, so you're getting all kinds of like conflicting messages from the voices in your head. And there's actually a second century Christian book, it's not in the Bible, but it talks about an angel of righteousness and an angel of iniquity. And whichever of these voices you listen to will affect your density, I mean, your destiny. <laughs> and as we all know, that's become like a very common trope throughout all of literature and film, and especially cartoons, right? But the thing is, in cartoons, it's always pretty obvious what the right decision is anyways, right? You've got the white-robed fellow on the right encouraging some sort of honorable action. On the other hand, you've got the red-faced, horned, trident-carrying guy on the left encouraging some sort of deceitful or unsavory thing. And in my experience, those voices aren't so cut and dry, and it's rarely about right and wrong. And for me, it has a lot more to do with a voice of wholeness or being more of the best I can be versus a voice of fear. And the challenge to that is, a lot of times, on any given day, you can hear the same message and not know where in the heck it's coming from. And I have to try to discern, am I supposed to leave my job or jump or stay? Is that because I'm afraid of where I'm at? Or is it because I'm, am I jumping because I'm afraid I'm here? Or am I staying still because I'm afraid to be there? Or I'm sticking here because it's really confusing. And so... I, at least, have had to learn that the voices in my head are usually wrong, and I just do the opposite. A few years ago, I met a designer named Jim LePage. And please follow this guy, because I would absolutely not be here if it weren't for him. And we had a lot in common, and we actually met right here at this event a couple years ago. And some of you who, any, who was here two years ago? 
All right. Some of you may remember one of the one guy was here. Uh, one of one of the common themes throughout that weekend was, as has happened in each year, these kind of underlying themes develop, was the power of collaboration and working together. So he and I had breakfast over here at Latitude, and we tried to figure out what can we do together. And we'd been watching projects like Momentus that Evan Stremke was doing and Dan's 50 State Mottos thing. And another guy you might not be familiar with, Eric Smith, who did a project called Live Now that you should look up because he's another cancer survivor like me and one of the most positive fellows you'll ever meet. And we wanted to do something similar with the Bible because that's something that he and I are both really interested in. The problem was we couldn't quite agree on what we wanted the thing to be. And so for the following months, we went back and forth, back and forth. What's this going to be? And finally, I reached one of these moments where I had to do the opposite is I had to let go. This is something I really wanted to do. I saw a ton of potential for it. But he had all the drive, all the gumption, all the time, and he was ready to roll with this thing. And so I let go, and I said, take it away, man. You'll probably do a better job with it than me anyways. And honestly, I think that may have been the magical candlelit moment when Old and New Project was conceived. And what we wanted to do through this project was kind of like reclaim religious and in particular biblical artwork from the sad condition in which it is, in which I don't even want to get into all that. And so in order to do that, we had to set some boundaries for ourselves. So we set up a set of core values that you can find on the website and one of which is that it's about the narrative. We're, this project is not about telling you you should believe this or that, or this is what this means, or this is how you should interpret this thing or that, and now go debate it. Although that would probably honestly get a lot more popular than what we're doing. We wanted it to be about the stories. One thing, despite anyone's feelings on the Bible itself, it has some great stories. And by focusing on just the, the tales themselves, it allowed us to include contributors from all different perspectives, from all different faiths, whether evangelical or atheist or just about anywhere in between. And so, so far that means we've had 62 different artists contribute. Some you know and would recognize their work immediately. Others are new to you and we do that intentionally. And, and a bunch have been a big part of this event, for example. Nate Utesh, Janet Kinsman, uh, Nate Williams, Matt Williams, uh, Shed Labs. Uh, who, where are you? Uh, Scott Allen Hill, uh, Ali Smith, uh, Evan Strumke, Julia Quo, who was here last year, Dan Christofferson, and Cassie McDaniel, who's not here because she's getting ready to have a baby. And the we, we felt it really important to include people from all different perspectives in order to deliver an honest story, which was another one of our core values. And in order to keep from exploiting these guys and basically donating the, these pieces to the project, and to keep from exploiting the stories themselves, we decided that we were going to donate our print sales, which are available on Society6, to a charity that provides clean water to those who don't have it. So what that means is that in a village in Africa, for example, if a girl can spend her day in school rather than walking miles and miles to fetch water and get an education, the data shows that her risk of contracting HIV later in life decreases exponentially. So what that means for us is that when Mikey Burton does an illustration of this crazy Old Testament king that loses his mind and lives among the beasts for seven years. There's a direct line from here to someone on the other side of the world having life, actual real life. So ignore the voices in your head because they may be keeping you from being a part of something that's much bigger than drawing on paper. I go camping with my buddies once or twice a year. We go up to the UP, camp along Lake Superior. And one time, we learned there was actually an island you can wade out to. It's maybe like 300 yards out into Lake Superior, and you hike to the other side of the island, and there's these 30-foot cliffs you can jump off. 
So as we're wading out, I decided I would not be jumping off the cliffs because that water was so cold. From the waist down, I felt like I was being stabbed with a billion needles, which isn't really as fun as it sounds. And we got out there, and, and my friends all stripped down, jumped off right away. And as they're clambering back up the rocks, my buddy T.C. Worley, who's a, who's a fabulous uh, Minneapolis photographer, by the way, looked me straight in the eyes, and he says, dude, I insist that you do this. And well, I couldn't really argue with that, and so I jumped. And it was really cold, and it hurt, and it actually like knocked the wind right out of me. I might have blacked out for a second. And it was totally awesome. And what I learned in that moment is that if I catch myself talking myself out of something, I should probably do it. And from that point forward, I, I, I committed. Anytime I'm near water, if I can, I'm getting in. I don't care how it's nasty and slimy or cold or whatever. I'm getting in. So... Ignore the voices in your head, go swimming, and I'm drawing a blank on what I was going to say next. So I'm going to talk about my boy. My wife and I actually did decide we wanted to have children, especially you know, after you lose one of your testicles, you think, well, maybe I shouldn't take this baby-making thing for granted. And so we didn't, man. We got right to it. And we had three kids, bam, 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 right in a row. And my oldest, Sadie, is the artist of the family, and Rivers is like, he's the youngest, he's like mini-me. And then Gideon, my middle child, he's beautiful, he loves comic books and video games, he fit right in here. And when he was two years old, he was diagnosed with autism. And at that time, he had no link. Does anyone in here have a two-year-old? Two, like a toddler, two, three-year-olds, you know, even, even the most introvert of two-year-olds is babbly. You know, they're talking, even if they have no vocabulary, they're, they're babbling back and forth, mom and dad. They run, they're excited when you come home from work, and he had nothing, not a single word. But we were hard at work, and we spent that year doing every type of intervention that we could, and we worked hard. And a year went by, and he still didn't have a single word. And... One day, we're playing this game where we pick him up in a blanket like a hammock and we swing him much higher than we probably should have. <laughs> and, and what you do is then you stop and you let him rest on the ground and you wait for a cue. And sometimes it was a giggle and, a, and if you're lucky, some eye contact. And he'd even started to sign once in a while more, we taught him. And he'd do that and we'd pick him up and do it again. And you continue that process and little by little he lets you in his world. And this day, we swung around, we set him down on the ground, and we waited like 10 seconds. And he said, more. <laughs> he spoke it. And we were freaking out, man. We were like hugging and crying, and we forgot to like pick him back up and do the thing. <laughs> But you know, what's, what's actually even more amazing than that first word is every single word he's ever said since. Like the other day when he said, whoever smelt it, dealt it. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's the little things that remind me that I exist. And when I'm reminded that I exist, it helps me to appreciate new baby smell and diesel fuel and PB&J and IPAs and sunshine and bare feet and fresh cut grass and dog farts and paperbacks and Polaroids and power cords and face melting and high fives and trampolines and wipeouts and wrong turns and cardigans and Polaroids and Poetry and bad movies and lightning bugs and scabs and side splitting and graffiti and loose teeth and magic wands and bass notes and corner stores and high school lockers and Saturday mornings and pockets and black eyes and snot rockets and slide tackles and sunburn and saucer sleds and ca business casual and strong coffee and singing the wrong lyrics at the wrong time. <laughs> 
and mixtapes and first kisses and last kisses and bumblebees and maple trees and skin knees and stinky cheese. And urinals that go all the way to the floor. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, what does that mean for us? And for me in particular, because during the day I work in marketing. Where everything has to make sense on paper because we're spending other people's money to make them more money. And so we're analyzing and testing and researching and studying. And we do way more math than design. And the danger in that is... If you only ever do what's working, you only do what's already being done. But we have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And we believe that there's something better. And so we take risks, and we create, and we try new things, usually on our own dime and not our client's dime, because we believe that there's something better than the best thing now. That first round of cancer actually shouldn't have been such a big deal. You know, there, there's like a 98% chance that I was going to live the rest of my days cancer-free. And just as I was approaching that magical five-year mark that cancer survivors look forward to, I knew something was wrong. I was in that 2%. And when the treatments for that didn't do the trick, I was in the 2% of that 2% which is not a very comfortable place to be. But it's not bad, because that is where you start to learn some things. And I learned that life is valuable, that it's short, that we're all dying, some just more rapidly than others. I learned to live in the moment, that my family can survive without me. And I learned that the best decisions don't always make sense on paper. And that true life isn't found in success or comfort. It's found in that 2%. So be brave. Be wild. Ignore those voices in your head. And go swimming. Thank you.